Hello, readers. Welcome to 20 Questions with Your Favorite Author, where we ask authors important questions like, why would you agree to be on this podcast? I'm Kelly Lynn Colby, Editorial Director at Curse Dragon Ship Publishing. Our guest this week is J.D. Astra, lit RPG writer and caller. Jess has been working at being a writer since before she could string more than two sentences together, and it never gets easier, but it does get better. In her spare time, she loves to cook, hike, play video games, and spend quality time with her people. If you, if she's not your favorite now, she will be after. Hello, hello! Welcome to the podcast. How are you this evening, Jess? I'm doing great. How are you, Kelly? Not too bad. I hope the intro was okay. It's not as good as an Audemar poem, but you know. Well, I mean, there are a few things that are that good. That's true. That is very true. That is very true. But this one's all about you. So, I mean, come on. There's a benefit there, right? Yes. You just say yes. Just say yeah. There you go. Good job. <laughs> so, we are so excited to have you on. Um, I'm wondering, when did you decide to take all of your awesomeness and just write a book? Well, a long time ago. Yeah, when I was like nine or ten, I was like, I've got so many great ideas. I better write them all down and make something horribly tropey and cliche. And well, hundred and twenty thousand yeah. words <laughs> at ten from ten to fourteen. Yes, that's yeah. impressive. Uh, it's on the shelf and it's garbage. So, but you should totally keep it. I think it's awesome. Just the one copy. That's all that will exist for all time <laughs> ever. I love it. It'll go in the Jess Museum someday. You never know. So when you turned your hand to writing, I guess that tells so that being your first book. So it was four years. It took you four years to write your first book. Yeah. 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 It's not bad, actually. Between like college work, college work. I wasn't in college at 14. <laughs> Class. Work. I knew you were a genius. <laughs> uh, yeah. Class work, getting in trouble with friends, that sort of thing. Just my side kick. So your characters, so writing that young, were all your characters like your friends and family? Or were they all like your favorite TV characters? Um, yeah, I had some that were like friends, family, adjacent, um, but a lot that were TV characters. I watched a ton of sci-fi when I was a kid and read a ton of sci-fi. So Me it was too. a sci-fi book, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> Oh, makes sense to me. I do have notebooks. Well, I don't have them anymore. See, that would be cool. Like I said, keep it. Where I was writing like a Star um, Star Trek. Mm, like so fanfic? I would just write all kinds of, yeah, Star Trek fanfic, man. I loved it. If there was the internet when I was that age, I would have been all over it. I have no doubt. Um, so let's see. So writing. Uh, we already have a question from the audience. See, this audience loves you, so we're going to get some from them. Because you play D&D with us on Monday night, so how fun mm -hmm. is that? Mm -hmm. So it's the amazing. writing wrongs. Love it. Right? It's so much fun. Um, so what is it about D&D &D that's so appealing to you? Um, that it's a collaborative storytelling experience. Um, video games are great, but it is like a bunch of people who got together and made a story and then force-fed it into your mouth. Right. Uh, whereas D and D is like the the DM has a couple of concepts, or maybe goes into great detail in planning his campaign that the players will completely ignore, um, <laughs> uh, and then all together, like as things kind of happen along the way, just like grows and and the the DM has to be a a really good storyteller in the way that they can kind of pull bits of information that the characters say along the way and like weave a really cool story. Um, I think you're doing a great job of that. Oh, why, thank you. I'm having a lot of fun and terrified the whole time. <laughs> but it's easy because y'all are fun. You know what I mean? Like, you're having fun, too. Like, if you were all about the rules and you were ironclad and, like, I was so excited when you did the fancy jump and you're like, I'm totally going to do this. <laughs> and when you thought about doing Thunderclap, I'm like, oh, no, you win. Yeah, go. <laughs> like, this, that was so fun. Like, you great. see it happening in a book, right, or a movie, and it was beautiful. I'm like, no, that's totally happening. I don't care what the rules are. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, Friday Blue wants to know if you have a blanket stash in real life. I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. she does yeah. live where it's cold, right? So it makes sense. I do, yeah. So there's a, <laughs> there's a little futon downstairs, and on the corner of the futon is about 12 blankets stacked on top of each other. So it was a natural. It was a natural. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, D&D &D characters, there's a little bit of us in it. 
Oh, yeah. there, there kind of has to be. And there's probably a little bit of us in all of our characters, whether we like it or not. Um, just, you know, more in some and less in others. And I'm wondering, so your D&D character was inspired by your main character in Monster Haven, right? Because Dollatrix in the fictional Dollatrix came first before D&D, yes? Yes, she did. Awesome. So I'm wondering, uh, first of all, we love that book. I say we because my whole family's reading it and we love it. So Monster Haven, get Monster Haven. And it's nice because it's a little bite size and they come out quickly. So like I could read the first one and then the second one came out. So I also feel accomplished. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so Dollatrix in Monster Haven, and then you have Dollatrix in d and I'm wondering, what do the two renditions have in common? Their backstory, um, but where the Monster Haven series gets started is where mm -hmm. they break apart. So the the <sighs> Dollatrix in the D and D game, instead of becoming the dungeon overlord and staying to like make her dungeon grow and help the people and fight heroes, uh, she decides to just like dip and take off uh, and leave her ruined village behind. <laughs> and she's like, I've had enough of this. <laughs> And just uh, goes to live on the run, looking for a nice new cottage she can settle down in with a pile of blankets. I love that. Well, yeah, at the beginning of the book, she does run away, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. She's a stowaway. Yeah. Well, no, in our story, oh, well, she's a stowaway. Book. Yeah. So in the book, she does kind of try to run, and then she's like, oh, maybe I should go back to the town and warn them and try to get them to leave at least. I can't be that much of a butthole. And she, so she goes back. I love it. So you have your own your own uh, multiverse going on. Mm -hmm. So in that one moment in the book, she decides to go back. In the D and D game, she's like, "Now nah, I'm out." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so since she left, who do you think took over? Do you think Greg took over? Like who took yeah, over the dungeon? Greg. It's definitely oh, Greg, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking it was definitely. He was Greg. the next highest level in that town, so it would have just defaulted to him. He'd have to be the overlord. Yep, yep, makes sense. Well, Maybe. I mean. The Waverns, actually, they were already oh, that's there. Oh, so that's right. <laughs> Maybe just gone to them. Who knows? That was uh, an interesting story of a town full of, like, humanoid monsters ruled over by two... Two dragons, two mating dragons. That could be fun. We'll have to remember that. We'll, we'll have to remember when we go save the Battle Axe town. Ah. Hmm, maybe we can bring that back. Um, so that's fun. Uh, the, uh, but <laughs> I can't keep talking about it cause we'll give too much away. You've got to read it. It's awesome. Um, but so you've got that one and that is a lit RPG and you also have the, um, Viridian Gate books that you've written, Firebrand that we talked about earlier, right? So the Firebrand series, uh, in the Viridian Gate universe. So, and, and both of these, they're lit RPG. What do you like about this genre? What, what attracts you to it? Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> in my past life, I was a project manager, so I lived in spreadsheets and data, uh, mm -hmm. and I really like data and spreadsheets mm -hmm. and numbers and making things work. So lit RPG is very much in that vein of like, you have to make a system that, that like makes sense and all fits together and, and, mm -hmm. uh, so I was also a project manager in the, in the game uh, in the gaming world. So uh, I oh, nice. made like sawtooth curve progression scales and those sorts of things. And so I do that for all my lit RPG books too. Hey, you're like, I did this for programming. I can put the chart in the book. No problem. Exactly. Same thing. Exactly. I like it. Now designing the chart for the book, that is a, like, I'm unfortunately also a graphic designer. That's what my degree is in. So, like, I've done all the numbers. I've done all the hard work. But my graphic design mind is like, you can't just slap that in there. You have to make it look good. <laughs> so, especially in my Zero Hero series. Now I'm calling it the wrong name. Zero Point Hero. But everyone just started calling it Zero Hero. So I went with it. Um, those screens are so, like, I spent hours designing those screens you're like they must be just right hours. hours that's so funny well i will tell you as the reader we totally noticed and appreciated all of your hard work Thank right you. everyone we're all <laughs> nodding <laughs> totally did yeah. everyone's just like oh it's another stat screen <laughs> yeah nobody just skips it i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> well it's interesting because lit rpg so you have these limitations based on these numbers does that help you be more creative in your story writing or do you feel it limits you um, so usually, I mean, like, sometimes it will put me up against an obstacle, but always 
whenever you're up against a difficult obstacle, that's when the best problem solving comes into play. Like you have to go back to chapter two and like drop a little hint that, that like makes chapter 15 work. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So probably more creative. I mean, I think anytime you go into a creative endeavor, having some boundaries around you helps with, you know, like you can explore those boundaries. You can see how far you can push past them and, Mm -hmm. and like, yeah. It's nice. It's a new challenge, exactly. right? Well, it's kind of cool. That That is it. Anything, because you might have an idea where you want the story to go. And people always like, but then the characters do things. But I, that's not, I won't say I don't think that's true. That's not true for me. What happens is there, a problem occurs that I didn't really consider when I was doing the outlines, right? So right. that might, you know, and then, so now I have to really be creative to solve this. So I, I can see the charts having the same thing. Like, no, I only have this many spells. Right. No, you can't yeah, be like your D&D. D&D. X number of times. <laughs> yes, right? So wait, did I do this yet? No, I got to... Re- okay, wait, the fight scene can't quite go like this. No, I can see that. I like it. Creative. Anything that forces us to work harder, I guess, is better when it comes to creating a story, not when it comes to laundry or dishes. No. Make no. those as easy as possible. Yes, I 100%. Um, let's see. Birdie wants to know, which of your characters do you most identify with? Rough. Um, oh man, this one's really tough. Mm. I think more recently, um, so this is funny, like as I grow as a person as well, my characters start to grow too. Mm. Um, so, so like Abby and Firebrand, she's (laughs) kind of angry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she's a little bit angry all the time. Um, and for what she was going through in her life, it, it made sense. But also, like, years ago, um, here's a little history nugget for me. I am divorced. And so, like, that was around that time. And I was still not a very happy person. And so it was easy for me to just kind of pour anger into her, you know? You're like, I get you, girl. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's burn this place to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, right so kind of now um, in my writing as I've like gone through this process of trying to become less of an asshole and more open minded and etc um, I really feel like I identify most with my new main character in the series that hasn't uh, come out yet which is Deathless Dungeon Years because um, he is very much this this like he's a little self-serving um like kind of a me first type person but also a don't leave anyone else behind type person um especially like if they can't care for themselves he's really really giving sometimes too much and sometimes too nice but um one of his quotes that actually some of my readers have pulled out is i'm not in the business of creating suffering um oh. and that's sort of one of my motto like I'm not in the business of creating suffering so i like it and by the way, that's the best answer we've had to that question. Because, of course, as we change, the character we're going to relate to the most will change. I love that. I hadn't even thought about that enough, but I think that's exactly it. Especially when you have so much. Like, I was looking at the uh, Bastion Academy. And that one is more, that one's not lit RPG, right? That one's more like steampunk? Uh, it's cultivation. So it's like a, a far future post-apocalyptic cultivation series. But there are steampunky type elements to it because he builds mechs and controls them with magic. Magic. It's like it's, Star Wars. No, I get that. It's all good. <laughs> no problem here. Uh, I don't know if I, I mean, like, I don't want to spoil it for anyone. So I won't say what the magic is, but there's big air quotes around magic. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. So um, in that one, uh, what inspired you to tackle that story? I got super inspired um, by Will White and Eden Hudson, who both write really great cultivation. Um, I also have been a bit of a weed since a child, of course. I watched anime all my all, whole life, and I'm like, yeah, I want to take on something like this. But a lot of the cultivation takes place um, in like Chinese or Chinese adjacent type worlds, uh, and some Japanese, but there were no Korean flavored ones. And I was like, well, I love Korean stuff like my stepmom was Korean and so I got raised on a lot of that like kind of cultural stuff and I was like yeah I'm gonna do that I'm gonna do a Korean cultivation story magical academy let's do it 
I have to say, I have no idea what that means. What does that? I thought that was just the series. So what does the cultivation story mean? Um, I'm not obviously an anime fan, so you feel me oh, out. No, no, no. Yeah. So cultivation isn't technically anime. Uh, like animes do include cultivation elements. So what it is is uh, about a character who uses um, like physical uh, effort, and meditation, and practice. It, it's do you know what progression fantasy? Where like the character works their butt off every day and night, super hard, and then they become the god of the world isn't that all fantasy <laughs> some fantasies cheat and they're just like and he got a magic sword that made him amazing um so <laughs> in cultivation that's not allowed um gotcha. and then usually there is like uh chi or chakra or or some other spirit energy and meridians within the body that have to be cleansed so that it can be opened so that new like magical or body powers can be used that channel energy through that meridian Cool. It's fun stuff. Oh, we'll have to talk about my series. It is not that specifically, but I'm definitely mm-hmm. getting on that, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's not. It's not cultivation. It's not of any kind of Asian culture whatsoever, but it's it's very interesting. I'm doing the same kind of thing. She's learning more about herself. Sure, like what she can do. Mechanics. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have to talk. Um, but that's very interesting. Well, thank you. I, I thought that was just a series. I did not even know that was a whole genre. I love this. Can I tell you I love this podcast? Thank you for being on. You're welcome. Learned thank so you for much. having me. Absolutely. Um, let's see. See, Birdie learned too. See, Birdie, isn't that cool? I had no idea. Um, let's see. So we talked about Bastion. Like, I'm going all over my question list. You know, I like to go just down it, but I like just talking to you. So now I don't even know where I am. So I could just ask you questions, I suppose. That's fine. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say that. Script. Like right, I'm going to go off script. I'm just going to make stuff up. <laughs> Did I mention I'm an outliner, not a pantser? Very uncomfortable making stuff up. Um, so you've been, you have so much out there. I mean, we've talked about like, you know, four different series already and all this cool stuff. Um, and they're all beautiful covers, by the way. So well done. I hate when we have people on and they have ugly covers. And I'm like, no, no picture covers. Um, I, I guess mean, that's part of your background, right? To <laughs> be fair. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. So I'm. I'm Shadow Alley Press's art director as well. Um, so a lot of these covers, not all of them, but a lot of them were managed by me. Um, so the ones that suck weren't me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> they were too. Yeah. <laughs> like I was learning. Okay, leave me alone. <laughs> um, but no, so, so yeah, it's been really cool to be part of that process and get to work with the art. I work with all of the authors at Shadow Alley Press now too, uh, except for a couple of the sci-fi um, line i don't do anything with them i offer my opinion every once in a while uh <laughs> but i don't like direct any of those um i don't remember where i was going with this yeah but the no i was just saying that the covers are awesome but i'm wondering <laughs> where where because i didn't ask a question so you were just clarifying the question is where do you recommend new fans of your work start that depends on what they like <laughs> Um, no, no, right, no. Like, Give orders. Come on now. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I would say that my best writing, hands down, is Deathless Dungeoneers right now. Like, it is the book where I am the most, like, wacky and fun, open and me, and just, like, I've enjoyed the whole process. Like, every time I sit down to write, I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> like there were several times in Firebrand where I was like, I hate what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but Deathless has been totally different. Uh, it's awesome. Really, really fun experience just coming up with like tons of crazy, fun, wacky things and just mm-hmm. being like, yeah, because I said so, because, because this is my book and text to you. Well, and this is your new series, the one where there there aren't any books out yet, right? Right. Uh, I think it's going up on pre-orders soon-ish, question mark. Where's DH done when you need him? Right? Jeez, he's probably, oh no, it's Tuesday, he's not. I was going to say, he's probably playing The Longest Night or whatever that, Darkest Night. Some horribly depressing game, so not kidding, it's completely on brand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. My backstory's not sad. <laughs> Have you read it? Um, yeah, so that, <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's our Dave. Um, the uh, 
the long dark. There you go. I knew it was something. I got the right words, just in the wrong orders. It is so a depressing. They're they're saying it's not a depressing game. It's totally a depressing game. Oh, Justin Herzog also just came on and says uh, three cheers for Monster Haven. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's a heck of a lot of fun. I'm quite enjoying it too. Um, the uh, so when the the new so the new series though, what is that? Is that lit RPG? Is that like what is that? What genre? No. It's so, this is so weird, and we we talk about it all the time, like, <laughs> there's a group chat for all the authors where we argue, what is lit RPG, what, to call it? what is game lit? Um, gotcha. So, typically in lit RPG, it is, mm-hmm. there are stat screens, hard stats, like the system trumps uh, anything else. Like, if the system says it can't happen, then it can't happen. It can't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's game lit. But gamelet is usually more like you're in a game world or mm-hmm. the world has been gamified in some way. Um, so there can be stat screens, but there don't have to be. Um, anyway, so I'm straddling both. Like I show some screens, but not like here is your character stat overview. You have five agility and 200 hit points and, and that sort of thing. And I don't deal in hit points either. It's just like you're, le- you're dealt damage and you're bleeding out and it sucks really bad and it hurts. And I so like describe how close they are to death in terms of like feelings rather than being like, and their HP bar was down to zero, which <laughs> sounds really, I don't know, just like a uh, robotic sometimes. So yes. Yes, I um, agree. So yeah, Deathless is straddling the line between lit RPG and game lit because it's not a game world, but the system is uh, very important. Um, I rely on it a lot. The magic system is is everything to the dungeons and how they function. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Very, very few screens. So you'll like it because there's like four screens max, but it's all about like the cool new abilities they're getting. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. I, I really like Monster Haven, but I 100% just skip every time there's a chart. I'm like, oh, look, chart, next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should give a rundown. You see why I'm a horrible DM? Oh, look, chart, oh. next. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine. And that's why, like, immediately after the chart, I always say, like, and she put points here, here, and here, and did this, and that's how it changed things. Because I know uh-huh. people skip those charts because they don't want to see them. So. And then you describe how the spell works. You know, so I've see, I see it. So I don't necessarily have to see what all the stats are. So so I guess that means it works for everyone. Just skip them. <laughs> Just skip uh, them. I got like a one-star review bomb, I think on Zero Point Hero. They were like, story was interesting, but weird boxy things everywhere could not read. And I was like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, now see, that's that's like reading horror and saying, um, there was blood in it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Whoever read that had no idea. See, I would not give you a bad review because I don't like the part of the genre that's supposed to be in there. Right? Like what the genre was. They're just like, look at this interesting cover. I'm gonna try this. (laughs) And they're like, what's with these charts? (laughs) Ah, readers are entertaining. They are very entertaining. Um <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna laugh about that one for a while. No, Why are there okay. charts in this that RPG? This is not <laughs> um well, let's see. Now I did tell you that on this podcast we asked the hard questions. I warned you. All right, so I have the hard question. So what's in the box? Could be a severed head, could be a penis. Mm, so we have to open it to find out. Mm. Sorry, this is a dual joke to the movie Seven uh, and Lonely <laughs> Island's Dick in a Box. <laughs> it was a it was a combo joke. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And for all the people who have no idea, uh, it's in her bio. She says there are three questions no one ever asks her, and one of them is what's in the box. So I had to ask her. You never know. It could have been blankets. Now I have to take that out of my bio. Thanks. You're welcome, because now I've asked it. <laughs> I have impacted your life negatively, because now you have to change about. Um, unless I'm nobody, then it counts. I can count as nobody. I don't mind. I like it better that way. Ugh. I always laughed. I said, you know, for someone who doesn't want any attention, I'm online a lot. <laughs> I don't know how this happened. Ugh. Oh, there you go, Bertie. Bertie says it's Schrodinger's dickhead. It is. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. 
Oh, I love it. That's just how you fix the bow. Say someone did ask. It's Schrodinger's dickhead. Um, let's see. The uh Oh, food. Can I say I'm so excited because you said you like to cook on your bio and there are just not mm-hmm. enough writers that like to cook. I'm like, how really? is that possible? Isn't this like one of those things you get to create with ingredients? That's what we do as writers, right? right. We create with these ingredients that are our characters and our setting and, you know, the mystery. So, I mean, cooking to me, it's the same darn thing. You take these ingredients, you cook. So I was like, she likes to cook. I'm so excited. So I have all the questions. Like, <laughs> I'm wondering, um, do you have any favorite dishes? Like, what do you really like to cook? Um, I don't cook it often, but there is a recipe that actually is in Firebrand 3, which is cow soy. Um, it's a Thai dish, and it's really, really, really good. <laughs> really, really good. I had it in Thailand one time, and I was like, I'm going to move here. <laughs> and then James and Jeanette were like, probably don't. You don't, I don't think you probably don't. They're like, um, been there, done that. Let me tell you something. (laughs) It was hot. There were bugs. We were trying to raise a small child. (laughs) I would not recommend. (laughs) Hey, we're done raising kids. We can go now to visit. Once I get super rich, I'll go have like a penthouse in Thailand. Hang out there for a while. They'll take care of the bugs for you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um... That's nice Thai. I'm not very good at Thai, but I also don't like things really spicy. So oh. I have to like, I like balance it. My stomach is like, please no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate to tell you, Jess, means you're getting old. I just want you to know. It's a sign. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to you now. There's a reason why I have ibuprofen on one side of me and Pepsi on the other. That's These are my go-tos. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Um. Is there any, so is there any, like, um, country's cuisine that you'd love to eat, but you're like, yeah, I'm not cooking that? Um, I mean, I'm down to try to cook anything. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's really anything. I mean, sometimes I'll look at a recipe and be like, four hours. Mm, <laughs> active cooking or in the refrigerator marinating right. like what's going on here <laughs> <laughs> how long do i have to stir this thing i'm out <laughs> yeah um so there are things that i have not made like um uh what's the delicious yellow sauce that goes on eggs benedict hollandaise thanks yeah i haven't made that because because you have to like perfect temperature and like stir the yolk into the hot butter and, and be very careful. And uh-huh. yeah. yeah. Because you might have egg drop butter soup and not hollandaise. That would just ruin my morning and mm-hmm. I, I laugh. That's why almost when I go to breakfast places, I almost exclusively get eggs benedict. And it's because I also do not enjoy making hollandaise sauce. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to make that. I'm gonna have them make it for me. That's great, man. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, for me, it's anything with big sauces. So it's actually like a lot of South, Southeast Asia. There's uh, some Mexican food. Like I love mole sauce, but I am not making it, man. I, we watched, uh, do you know who Roy Choi is? Mm -hmm. He is a chef. He worked with, um, John Favreau. If you've not seen the movie chef, totally see that. Seriously. Have you seen chef? No, I haven't, but I know John Favreau. John Favreau, right? Yeah. So they, they work together. They actually have a show. It's it's a long, we could do a whole podcast on that. Not kidding. <laughs> um, but watch Chef. Trust me. We've seen okay. enough that we have enough similarities. You will love Chef. Okay. Um, the uh, highly recommended. But the person who taught John Favreau, he's the star of it. <laughs> uh oh. He's there's a spotlight on her. <laughs> no, it's just my partner's desk. His monitor faces my face. So anytime. <laughs> and it's not a dark mode? <laughs> The um, but on the on the show on the chef Roy Choi taught him how to cook it. Well, we watched him once just make tacos, right? Nice and simple taco. It was like an Asian influence kind of taco, right? But he made three different sauces, and one of the sauces had to use one of the other sauces in it to make that sauce. Just, I'm like, you know, I'll just go to your restaurant. I am not. That's just, <laughs> yeah. I respect you, and I'll just pay for that instead. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But watch Chef. You totally should. And then you could put some quotes in your bio about Chef. It's awesome. You'll love it. Um, I think we might have gotten through all the big questions. We might just have lightning round. I don't know. 
I think I think I asked you all the hard things. All right, lightning round. These are the important ones. These are the ones the audience may or may not judge you on. So sorry. Ready? Okay. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Butter. Oh my gosh! Do you get bluebell ice cream where you are? Um, some it's a little expensive, so no, I don't usually get it. I don't get a lot of ice cream. I don't eat a lot of ice cream. I don't eat a lot of sweets. Mm -hmm. I know, right? That's most of my, my, all of my weight is bread and ice cream. That's it. That's it's all. Well, I eat bread. <laughs> I'm a, like a salty, crunchy, savory person. Those are my go-tos. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. No, the Blue Bell just has a chocolate peanut butter ice cream that's brand new and it's amazing. And they need to stop making it or I'm going to get even more hips. Um, can zombies climb? Depends on how old they are. Like how <laughs> fermented they are. Yes, that is a good question or a good answer. I like that. Uh, what is your favorite mythical creature? That's from Friday Blue. I don't want to be cliche. Dragons, man, they're so freaking cool. They are, though, right? Because they could be cool. anything. Yeah, no, 100%. Can't find each other on that one. Uh, what is your favorite fast food restaurant? Good times. Good times. <laughs> nice choice. Look Good at times. that. I like it. Big Daddy uh, Bacon Cheeseburger <laughs> with the extra wild sauce. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm hungry now. Stop it. <laughs> Um, pick one, Star Trek or Star Wars? Trek, duh. I mean, God, that's oh. hard, though. I'm a fan of both. I'm a huge fan of both. But I grew up on Star Trek. Like, here's a, here's a great story for the podcast. Um, my mom tells it to me. I don't know if it's a lie or not, but I think it's funny. So I'll keep passing it around. <laughs> when I was quite young and had to be bathed by my parental units, um, the only way they could get me into the bath was they promised that Star Trek would be on right after the bath, <laughs> unless I didn't take the bath and then it wouldn't be on. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, so I would I, take a bath. Right. Yeah. So I took a bath. Um, but as soon as that music started, I was like, bath over. <laughs> <laughs> bath is over. So every once in a while, I would leap out of the bath completely naked and soaked <laughs> and like run around the house with my arms out, pretending that I was the Enterprise. Enterprise singing the song that's the best <laughs> i'm with you i don't care if it's true or not it's it's true enough i i would i would totally stick with that that it's is great <laughs> by the way man nod to your parents good for them that's impressive i like it um who is your favorite band or musician um i think dance gavin dance is still on my hot list they were my 2021 20, most listened so yeah definitely them excellent good choice i've never heard of them i have to look them up now you should they're very math core uh, they have some screaming so i i know that, that lots of people are like don't scream in the earls but tillian has a beautiful voice and it's like a great balance of, of beautiful between the singing two and screaming <laughs> and they say ridiculous things like the screamo guy just says the most ridiculous stuff in his lyrics so it's hilarious well do they have um um prestidigitation in in their lyrics or um australopithecus because that's my favorite band they have those words in there i don't think so ah <laughs> any of the songs i've heard so far <laughs> next we're gonna send them an email see what we can do uh what is your least favorite chore around the house so many to choose from <laughs> <laughs> you're like the house ones <laughs> uh, okay oh no I got it because I never do it dusting. Oh. I hate to dust like I have to pick everything up so that I can clean and then put everything back down <laughs> yeah the base of my monitor is dusty and it'll distract me I'm like I should clean that okay work now <laughs> I'll just put some stuff here so that when that gets dusty, I'll put more stuff on top of it. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And finally, where can fans find you and your work? There's a couple of different places. If you want to read unedited stuff where you will definitely find typos and grammatical errors, but for free and fast and new, you can go to Royal Road. <laughs> 
Um, and on Royal Road, I'm Jess Diastra, not J Diastra, because I don't know why I did that. That was pretty dumb. <laughs> uh, Obviously, Amazon is a great place to find everything that's published and to pay me for things if you like to do that sort of thing. I'm mm -hmm. hungry. I need that big dead bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> um, uh, I'm also on Patreon, uh, which is the most direct way to like help influence the books and get your names in the back and help name stuff. Like I have a new realm that's coming out in the Deathless Dungeoneer series, and uh, I ran a poll on both Patreon and Royal Road for for people to decide what it's going to be. I think it's going to be The Ease, which is really interesting. That'll be fun. Well, also, now that Jess is your new favorite author, please make sure to review her work wherever it is you get your books. And you can also review us wherever it is you get your podcast. You can also subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitch. And we'll see you next week where we have Susan McCauley. Bye.